Welcome to Module 6. Um, last week we finished up with circulatory and we talked a bit about blood. Um, today we are going to move on to respiratory. Um, just a couple notes. It is not nap time in my household right now, so if you hear my kids screaming, I apologize. Um, tis life. So, anyhow. Let's talk about respiratory. Um, we've got three more modules in the school year left. So um, we're going to be hitting a chapter a week. Um, so we're, we're going to do respiratory now, then digestive, then reproductive. Um, so I'm going to cover mostly just anatomy with touches of physiology here and there. Um, so we're making do. Let's dive into this week's PowerPoint, shall we? Okay. Now, um, next Monday is Memorial Day. So I have your assignment due on Tuesday, um, just an FYI there. Obviously, I'll, it, you can turn it in at any point, uh, but the deadline will be Tuesday. For respiratory system, we're looking at gas exchange between blood and our external environment. Um, so we're taking in and then getting rid of what we no longer need. Uh, the actual exchange is occurring in the alveoli Everything else is pretty much the pathway to get there. Um, but that pathway has a very important role because as you bring in um, air from your external environment, keep in mind your body is constantly maintaining homeostasis and making sure that your temperatures and you know water levels and all kinds of things, pH, are balanced. Um, and that includes the air that's coming in. It needs to be filtered for debris, warmed for your body, and humidified. Um, think about when you're outside in the cold in winter. It kind of hurts to breathe sometimes. Or um, if the air is too dry, you can feel it kind of drying up your nasal passages and your sinuses. It's, it's uncomfortable. And so those passageways are going to help warm the air and humidify the air as it makes its way to your lungs. Um, speaking of the passageway, uh, the general um, path is you're going to start with the nose and nasal cavity to the pharynx. The pharynx is the back of the nasal cavity and kind of like the start of your throat. Your larynx uh, which is your voice box. Um, I just think of larynx and language to kind of compare those two. Uh, your trachea, your bronchi, and then in the lungs you have your alveoli. And we're going to talk about these um, individually, but let's go over just an overview here. Let me move me out of the way. Okay. So starting off with the nasal cavity, um, the nasal cavity has specific ridges called concha that are going to help spiral the air to warm and humidify. Um, as you breathe in, of course, you have your olfactory cells that are going to absorb any chemicals for smell. Um, and then you have hairs that will help prevent the passage of dust and hopefully those particles get caught in the mucus that's produced in there. Um, from there, sorry, I know I go out of order, but it makes more sense to me this way. You have your pharynx, so that is going to be kind of the back of the nasal cavity and the start of the throat. The pharynx is going to be shared by both the respiratory and digestive systems. Um, however, at the pharynx, that's where the sharing ends. From there, respiratory has its own unique um, organs 
the larynx being where vocalization occurs, the trachea, um, which is quite long and uh, rigid. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We have both right and left lung. Keep in mind, we refer to right and left as in the patient's body, not our own. Um, our lungs have a membrane surrounding them. It's actually a double membrane called pleura. We'll get to that in a little bit. And then the muscle that is um, controlling inhalation, exhalation is the diaphragm. Okay, so when that diaphragm contracts, Sorry, I didn't realize this thingy was in the way. There we go. So your diaphragm is kind of like an umbrella. Um, I know it's probably been a while since you have covered this in chemistry, but an increase in volume leads to a decrease in pressure, and pressure is going to go from high regions to low regions. So when your diaphragm flattens, volume of your lungs increases, it's going to pull in air from the environment into your lungs to fill that volume. Once the diaphragm relaxes, it pushes up. It's going to decrease volume. Therefore, it's going to increase pressure and force air out of the lungs. Okay. Moving on. All right, um, I don't have a whole lot that I wanna say about the nasal cavity, so we are going to um, jump to the larynx, trachea, and lungs. Um, so yeah. You have thyroid cartilage here. Um, this is where we're gonna have our thyroid at. Um, and then we also have cricoid cartilage. Uh, the cricoid cartilage is in a couple of places in the larynx, uh, mainly for structural support. Your trachea is this long tube-like, and you can see these lines, these rings, this is more cartilage. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Uh, your trachea is going to branch off into the bronch Guy. Bronchi is plural, bronchus is singular. So you have your right primary and your left primary. If you've had bronchitis, you've had inflammation of the bronchi. Um, and then, of course, from the bronchi, we enter into the lungs, and there's some more structures in there that we're going to talk about in just a bit. Here at the larynx, we're now going to really dive into the structures here. At the very top, by the way, this is the anterior view here. So from the front, looking at the throat, this is from the side if it was cut in half. Okay. So first structure I want to note here is the epiglottis. The epiglottis uh, serves a very important role to prevent the passage of food into the respiratory system. So when you swallow food, um, as food goes into the pharynx, this epiglottis is going to close over the glottis um, and direct food to follow the esophagus instead. So um, if you have, if you've ever accidentally, you know, inhaled while you were drinking something and obviously it makes you cough uh, that's because the glottis was not uh, the epiglottis was not fully covering the, the larynx um, and so whatever liquid or food was able to get in there which does not belong there you also have your hyoid bone um, I talked about this briefly during the skeletal unit this is the bone in your neck that um, medical examiners will look for to see if it's snapped, if somebody is experienced, well, if they were killed by strangulation, experienced strangulation, anyhow. Um, it's also what tends to snap if um, the individual has hung themselves. So 
for those of you going into forensic science, um, you will be familiarized with this portion um, because the larynx and the hyoid bone are um, likely to be crushed in that instance. So you'll have quite a bit of studying around this section of, of the body. Your thyroid cartilage, again, your thyroid gland would be resting just here in um, anterior to this. It's a butterfly shape. You have corniculate cartilage. I'm not too worried about you knowing all the functions of these different cartilages. Just know that there are quite a few different types of cartilage um, and cartilage is a connective tissue. The vestibular fold is right here. We're looking at just this tissue here um, that's just beneath the epiglottis. Your vocal fold, which is also known as the vocal cord, is right here. As you exhale, and technically when you inhale too, um, you can control the vibration of these cords and therefore vocalize. Arytenoid cartilage, again, not super concerned with you knowing its function. Conus elasticus. Cricothyroid ligament. This is going to help connect um, the oh, here, cricoid cartilage and the thyroid cartilage together. There's a ligament there. Uh, this is your cricoid cartilage here. And then finally, you have your trachea. Key, key items here, epiglottis, glottis, hyoid bone, vocal cords, and trachea. That's what I'm concerned with right now. All right, briefly, because we ended with the trachea here, we're going to pick up with the trachea in this diagram. Um, it also mentions the bronchial tree, but I don't think this sh shows a whole lot about the bronchi. So we're going to talk more about the bronchi in a couple of slides. Um, but as for the trachea, um, you have these tracheal rings that surround the trachea. Uh, these are made of um, hyaline cartilage. Uh, it's pretty rigid cartilage. It's important that our trachea be reinforced with this hyaline cartilage because as you inhale, change in pressure, um, because again, when our diaphragm decreases, it's going to cause a decrease in pressure as there's an increase in volume, and it can actually cause the collapse of a structure like this. Think about if you have a milkshake and it's really thick and you were to inhale or to you know breathe in through the straw and it kind of suctions closed because it's so thick that you're having an increase in um, pressure and it's causing a decrease in volume. So we need to make sure that with no matter what's happening to the pressure as we inhale and exhale, we need to maintain the volume of the trachea, right? We, we don't want the volume of the trachea to change. Uh, the volume change occurs in the lungs and the hyoid cartilage is going to make sure, it's going to reinforce the trachea to make sure it doesn't collapse. Where the trachea ends, and branches off, we have a structure called the carina. The carina is what branches into the left and right primary bronchioles, uh, bronchi, sorry. Um, and again, right and left as in the patient's right and left. Here's just another look at the trachea. If we cut it in half, here's this tracheal ring. This is made of hyaline cartilage. This is going to prevent the collapse of the trachea as we inhale and exhale. We do have this muscle here, though, called the trachealis. Um, the trachealis muscle 
just behind it in this little imaginary circle I'm drawing is the esophagus. And sometimes if you um, were to chew on something that maybe is a little too much food, like if you bit too much um, or swallowed too much food, it has to make room. The esophagus has to be able to accommodate that additional volume. And so in the case that the esophagus has to expand, it's allowed to push into this trachealis muscle. Um, that's why sometimes if food gets caught in your throat, it might be hard to breathe in your esophagus. Obviously, if it's caught in your trachea, you're choking. Okay. All right, let's talk about the membranes real quick. We've got the trachea, uh, and then we have this, just for reference, we have this double membrane here. Your parietal pleura is what's lining the thoracic cavity. So on the um, attachment of this is like your rib cage. The membrane that's directly um, adhered to the lungs is the visceral pleura. And in between that, we have the pleural cavity. This pleural cavity is what's going to allow the expansion and contraction of the lungs as we inhale, exhale. Um, and we don't really want friction against the lungs and that parietal pleura. Uh, so we, we've got that cavity there as kind of a safe space. So again, we've got our two pleuras. In between those pleuras is our um, cavity. Your right lung has three lobes, superior, middle, and inferior. Uh, they are separated by these sections called fissures, F-I-S-S-U-R-E-S, -S -S -E fissures. Um, and as you can see, so here is like the uh, um, shadow of if you were to inhale, this is the space that that lung would occupy. So right now it's contracted, and if it were to expand it would, I'm sorry, yeah, if it were to expand, it would fill this area. On the other side, your left lung, you've only got two lobes, superior and inferior. Uh, that's because if you recall the orientation of the heart, the heart's apex actually points into the left side. And so we have this cardiac notch here to allow for the, um, heart, the para, um, pericardial cavity to be in there. So we've only got superior and inferior lobes on the left lung, whereas we have three lobes on the right lung. Earlier we had the um, break, uh, brachial, not talking about arms, bronchial tree. I think this shows the bronchial pathway better so if we were to say start with the left primary bronchus, um, I know that this isn't on the diagram, I just added it. Um, you, each branch takes you another level in. So from the carina, you then have your left primary bronchus. It divides to provide you with the secondary bronchus. That divides into the tertiary bronchus. These are our bronchi type of bronchus. Um, and these all have supporting cartilage to prevent the collapse. Just like I mentioned with the um, trachea. Now, as you continue to divide, they get smaller and that's when they're called bronchioles. So just like arteries became arterioles and venules and veins, bronchioles is like the smaller version. Um, it is possible to have bronchiolitis. Um, most of you are probably more familiar with bronchitis, um, but bronchiolitis is just if you have inflammation of the bronchi, uh, bronchioles. Uh, and then from our bronchioles, we end up in the alveoli. The alveoli are where gas exchange occurs, okay? So this here is a cross section if we were to cut into one of those um, alveoli. One 
alveoli is an alveolus. Okay, so alveoli is plural, alveolus is singular. Um, around all of these, and you'll see it better in the next image, we have capillaries, so these have been cut, uh, that are bringing our blood supply. Um, within that blood supply, of course, we have our red blood cells that are going to be carrying oxygenated blood. Um, and then we also have the septal cells. Septal cells produce a um, secretion called surfactant um, because your lungs are quite spongy. And as you inhale, exhale, uh, this is another measure that's going to help prevent friction. That surfactant is kind of like mucusy, um, so that you can comfortably inhale, exhale. All right, let's look at the alveoli put together. All right. So I'm going to skip just to where you can see all of these. Here's our alveoli which are these little grape-like structures. This is most of the tissue in your lungs, okay, these alveoli. A whole bunch of alveoli is called an alveolar sac. And each alveolar sac has an alveolar duct that's going to it. So the um, air from the environment is coming in from the bronchi to the bronchioles, um, to the alveolar ducts and to the alveoli. Okay, so here's where our oxygen's coming in. We need that oxygen to get into our blood. So here's an example where the capillary is still in place here. Around each alveoli, we have these capillary beds, these nets of capillaries. Remember, capillaries are only one cell thick. Same goes for the alveoli. That means that there's only two layers here that oxygen has to diffuse through. And oxygen is excellent at diffusing, um, so the oxygen will go into the bloodstream. At the same time, any carbon dioxide that is being returned to the body um, is able to be um, exchanged back into the alveoli for exhalation. And then once we have gotten rid of the oxygen, uh, once we've gotten rid of the carbon dioxide and picked up the fresh oxygen, we are going to travel back to the heart through the pulmonary vein. Okay, so pulmonary artery has our deoxygenated blood that's been used up. It's picking up oxygen, getting rid of carbon dioxide, and then heading back to the heart so it can go into systemic circulation. Sorry. A couple of disorder testings. I'm sorry that we don't get to do these, um, but for those of you going into the medical field, you will become very familiar with these. Um, and some of them you probably already are familiar with if you have gone to patient first before or any other medical facility. Um, pulse ox is one of the most common. Uh, this is the little thing that they put on your finger. And they're essentially looking at what is the percentage of blood, um, oh, I'm sorry, what is the percentage of oxygen in your blood compared to its max capacity? Um, so if you are maintaining a level of 95% or more of your max capacity, um, that is considered normal. Um, if they want, if they need to compare carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. They'll do an arterial blood gas level where they take a blood sample. Chest x-rays, um, lots of reasons that they might do this. Most commonly for masses, um, congestion, fluid, like if you have pneumonia, um, or if there's an infection, okay, so that they can view that. So say that you are having difficulty breathing, your pulse ox is low, um, if your arterial blood gas levels are showing low oxygen and high carbon dioxide, it's likely that something's going on in your lungs because there's not a proper exchange going on, so they'll do a chest x-ray. 
Another option is pulmonary function tests or PFTs. Um, this is when you are doing some type of, well, likely to do some type of activity that um, is going to test lung capacity, volume, your intake and outtake, and your functioning of the lungs. These can be done static or active. Um, so like at a, in a resting phase, or if you were, say, on a treadmill running, doing an exertion test. Um, and part of that PFT is spirometry. Um, there's quite a few videos that you can look up to do your own spirometry, um, like at-home methods, um, which is quite interesting. Um, I was able to test this in college, and... Um, it, it's amazing to see how spirometry really is affected by body size, um, and by activity type and by your habits. So for example, I'm 5'4", um, in college I was kind of smaller, so I was a small person and it was expected that I'd have a really small lung capacity. Um, and... Normal is around like five or so for a woman, five liters of air. Uh, and mine was around 4.5. So that was expected. Uh, my partner, who was around 6'2", um, who was a male, obviously much larger than I am, um, his average lung capacity should have been around six. However, he was a smoker and his lung capacity was four. So a six foot two guy had half a liter less of capacity than I had just because his, he had done so much damage to his alveoli through smoking. So spirometry is very interesting. I'm going to show you what a spirograph looks like. Spirogram. Spirograph. Spirogram looks like. Um, there's quite a bit of information here. On your note sheet, I've given you a spot where you can fill in what the um, volume is called and its description. This is something that you will be taking a screenshot of or copying and pasting into one of your assignments um, this week. So that, so make sure that you do this part. Maybe. There we go. Okay, so this is a spirogram. This is just breathing in and out, okay? Uh, however, you'll see here, there's a big increase and decrease, and we're going to talk about what those mean. So first off, let's start here. This is your tidal volume, okay? Your tidal volume is your normal inhale-exhale. That's tidal volume right there. Normal, not doing anything crazy, okay? Now, if I were to inhale my normal tidal volume and then try to inhale even more, that's my inspiratory reserve. Okay, so your inspiratory reserve volume is what you can inhale in addition to your tidal volume. So, Okay, and that's just the amount that I could go beyond my tidal volume. If I add those two together, if I add my tidal volume and my inspiratory reserve volume, that gives me my inspiratory capacity. How much can my lungs hold? Just in general, okay? So all the way from here to here. Now, on the flip side, say I'm breathing in and out normally, and then I try to exhale even more, that's my expiratory reserve volume. So my expiratory reserve is how much I can exhale in addition to the tidal volume. 
Okay, so not including the tidal volume. So how much beyond my tidal volume can I breathe out? No matter how much you try to breathe out though, your lungs can't, well, I mean, they could completely collapse. That would require a totally different um, set of skill. Um, but in general, um, our lungs will always have some volume to them. Uh, so we have what's called residual volume. Once you expire as much as you can, you still have an amount of air left in your lungs. The amount that's left in your lungs after expiration is your residual volume, okay? It will always be in your lungs. You can exhale as much as you try with all your might. There will still be air in there. Um, if we were to talk about how much we can exhale plus our residual volume, that's called functional residual capacity. Okay, so in other words, after we exhale from our tidal volume, what's left? The normal amount that's left in your lungs. Okay, so I know it's a lot, guys. We got this. From there, if we look at, if we were to completely exhale, That gives us our vital capacity, okay? So the volume of air that you can inhale after breathing out. So. <sighs> vital capacity, okay? I exhaled as much as I could, and then I inhaled as much as I could. Now. If we take our vital capacity and the residual volume that's always in our lungs, we have our total lung capacity. Okay, and so based on your um, residual and uh, tidal, inspiratory, expiratory, etc., um, there's different programs that can estimate your total lung capacity. And so here, this is a graph most likely for an adult male. Um, it's showing that volume is six liters. Um, so the amount that they, the individual can inhale as well as what remains in the lungs. For me, I was more around here. Um, and like I said, the the gentleman that was my partner for lab was way below because he, like I said, he was a smoker and, and that makes a big difference. Okay. So I know it's not a whole ton of physiology. I'm sorry, but we covered the anatomy. And if you have any questions, make sure that you contact me. Um, you know the drill. You can do email. It's learning chat or remind. Um, there's only three questions this time around. So I want you to be able to describe the pathway of airflow through the organs, starting with the nose, ending with the alveoli. Um, and then, uh, and by that I also mean the different stages of bronchi, bronchioles. Um, describe how the anatomy of the trachea enforces its physiology. In other words, what does its cartilage have to do with preventing collapse? Um, and then share your spirometry note table. So the table that was in your notes, you should have gone through, for example, when I said vital capacity, um, tidal volume, sorry, tidal volume is normal, inhale, exhale, tidal volume, normal, inhale, exhale, right? So I would like to see your descriptions of the different lung volumes. Um, these are also, by the way, spirometry, it's not only relevant for people who are going into nursing, um, but also definitely for sports med, athletic training, um, respiratory therapy. Uh, there's a lot of different uses for spirometry, so it's, it's a good thing to be familiar with. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.